I'm opening. We have an eye, part of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Here we go, folks. Nice. So are we, we uh, going to talk we're about the trailer? <laughs> I think we're well, just listening. This is American Hustle, as directed by David O. Russell. We're listening to what was the song in the teaser trailer, Correct. Um, which is what got me hooked to this movie. It was a great trailer. Almost a year ago? Yeah. <laughs> With the way that they released trailers? Yeah. Yeah, let's say a year, year and a half, five years ago. And now the movie's finally, well, for us, out. Correct. In Select Studies, out nationwide December 20th, but here we are discussing it. Um, I am your host, Phil Svitek. Join alongside. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Stratton. Hello, everybody. It's Dimitri Panos. And uh, I do want to give a disclaimer <coughs> at the top because, um, you know, uh, I was very much looking forward to seeing this movie. Unfortunately for me, it didn't quite live up to the hype. That will not, um, don't worry, this will not be a, uh, an hour and a half tirade of me hating the movie. <laughs> I will dissect it from a filmmaker per- perspective, as I know Sarah will. Yes, because um, I'm going to try and focus on, you know, what I really thought was good about this movie. Maybe it was because it was so built up for me that I went away not sh- shouting from the rooftops that I love it. There are some things that I do love. And some things that missed a mark in my and, book. Uh, and but Dimitri- it is a good movie. I I will give it it's a good movie. And Dimitri, you loved it. I thought you were going to open up by saying, uh, you know, when you said I have to preface this by saying some of these events actually happened. Oh. <laughs> well, but these but events all of these are events happening. happening. <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. And yes, uh, I did. I did love this movie. Uh, yeah. I, it was when I was from the first 10 minutes I was pulled in uh, by the end of this movie. I saw it again. I've never really done that, even with the Star Trek movie. I've seen Star Trek movies twice within one day, but never back to back. Interesting. <clears throat> so in this movie, the opportunity just arose, and I went with it. So let's just say You said that Sunday. this is one of your top... This makes my top three. Of this year or just ever? Of this year. Okay. Yeah, not ever, uh, but, but of this year, absolutely. Okay, I mean, you know... Um... I, and for me, I was really much looking forward to this. I mean, uh, hearing the fact that it's a David O. Russell movie, I love Christian Bale. Bradley Cooper's been doing amazing work. Who doesn't love Jennifer Lawrence? Amy Adam. You can gush, just Adams. gush over. Yes. Uh, Jeremy <clears throat> Renner. The, you know, everything for me, it was just the perfect equation. And, um, unf- uh, you know, I was looking forward <clears throat> to it because of The Fighter and because of um, Silver Lines playing, Playbook last year. I thought this would be the perfect storm for a movie um although going to the writing i think this is i think initially it failed in the sense that um given the backstory of it sure first off you know as you mentioned uh some events um did happen right so just by putting that right up the front allows you creative freedom within it as long as some events happened right or Mm -hmm. there's that notion um so this th- this script initially was written uh, years ago by Eric Warren, right? Mm-hmm. Eric Warren Singer is his name, or Sanger, or that thing. Yeah, he's credited that as such in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it was it took a long time to kind of really get it there and be picked up. And supposedly right. it was blacklisted, correct? Yeah. Yes. And was it, it was originally called American Bullshit. Mm-hmm. Was the original title that would have been a good title? Yeah. That 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 yeah that was the original title. That was his uh, original thing, so, yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, it was originally supposed to be directed by Ben Affleck. And the, in, in, in kind of seeing it, it, it almost, in some ways, it felt kind of like Argo. I mean, there, I, th- I think there's a thing with it where it's just too close to Argo. In, in okay. terms of timing. Oh, in I, actual yeah. timing. Timing, theme. I mean, you, you know, Argo was 70s. This was pure 70s. And, yeah, absolutely. The yeah. timing was, yeah. 
I, I, I'm wondering how many years apart the events of Argo, which is way more true to true to life and story, uh, than let's see here. <clears throat> and they mention Ab Scam. Uh, American Hustle takes place within historically takes place within Ab Scam. Um, you know, which has that as its backdrop and part of, you know. Which is 1978 but, okay, to 1980. Right. And then Argo, I think, might have... No, Argo had to be around the same time because they were... Star Wars. Uh, they were making a science fiction movie. So yeah. I'm guessing it was about 77. Yeah, so you're right, yeah. See? I so it, timing's right. Yeah. I, you know, and, and so obviously, you know, just right off the bat, compare, it had... Well, let me... Theoretical question. How would you guys feel had Ben Affleck directed this movie? I think um, I can't answer that question because he didn't. Fair enough. I mean, well, like, <clears throat> I don't know if that's why I'm. Do you think there would be a backlash if, like, you just made two very similar movies? Um, I think there would have been comparison, but I also think that Ben Affleck would have made American bullshit mm -hmm. more so than what we got from David O. Russell. Well, so I, I think that, you know, he would have made another 70s historical piece that would have been more historically accurate yeah. than what we got. So. I mean, with this movie, I mean, it, it's very much a, it has all the elements of a David O. Russell movie. When he signed on to the project, you know, he rewrote it in, where he basically made everyone caricatures of themselves. And obviously, knowing him, he made it more of an ensemble piece. Sure. Um, so that, in terms of the writing, that's what David O. Russell brought to it. But he did a he did a page one rewrite um, when 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 the original script uh, was given to Bell, and then David was getting his hands on it. Bill Bill was like, Whoa, "What the what the f are you doing, man?" And like, cause he did a page one rewrite, like just from the get go, and he came up with like a hundred and forty, hundred and seventy page script. So whatever Eric had done, he had completely rewritten. Uh, American American bullshit apparently was very procedural, which is why I think they were interested in getting Ben Affleck after after you see a movie like Argo and what he did. You know, Argo to an extent is very procedural, you know, and how it goes. And and David O. Russell said, you know, what this isn't my kind of a movie. I I I, I want it to be more about characters. Uh, and, and, and I want it to be about characters, about reinvention, about, uh, I don't want to say rejuvenation, but about, um, uh, um, you know, making one better life. Oh, and actually transformation. And uh, so he just rewrote completely. Like, whatever is left of, of the original screenplay. It's very little. What did Christian Bale? You, you said that Christian Bale was totally. What, do you, what yeah, was his reaction? Like, his, he, what the fuck? He goes in what a are good you doing? way or a bad way. Uh, he didn't know. He he was like, what are you, what are you doing? And so basically, what David O. Russell did was he um uh, he actually went to each of the main actresses' houses and such, and he he basically said, okay, this is what I want the character to be. What do you think about this? What do you think about this character? And he allowed people like Christian Bale uh, and Jennifer Lawrence and, and Amy Adams to flesh out their characters. It would go, oh, okay, that's great. Oh my God, that's great. And they would talk about it. And then he would go in and he would write that, put that into the script. And then he he put his, his quote unquote, his love triangle, so to speak, in there. And he made a movie about redemption, because uh, that's another theme. He uh, he actually sort of kind of likened this to uh, uh, when he when you look at Silver Linings, the fighter in this movie, he says thematically it's a trilogy for him because each movie has a story of someone who's reinventing themselves, someone who's seeking redemption to do better. And he says this is what he wanted to do. And, and, and he wanted to make it a love story as well. And those are the things that to David O. Russell in this point in his life is very important to him. And he felt that with American bullshit, that it was a little bit cyn cynical and procedural. And he says, that's just not my style. So it's actually sort of kind of amazing that he was allowed to take somebody screenplay who worked hard at it he gets credit but he just rewrote it and he didn't make it like historically accurate he didn't he didn't want that so much i mean they they he changed the people's names he added these characters uh and uh yeah and christian bell is like you know he thought it was a good script and he's like well, what are you doing and ultimately christian bell is like i've worked with him i trust him 
okay, let, let's work this out. And, you know, for me, they worked out like some American cinematic magic. I mean, you know, uh, and maybe this is a question for Sarah, um, slightly hypothetical if I ask you. Uh, in whenever an actor, for me, that, you know, it's interesting that he trusts, David O. Russell trusts his actors enough to get their opinion because obviously, you know, the worry would be if you ask an actor of like, hey, what should your character be? Well, anything that gets me more pages. Oh, you know, I, that would be yeah. that would be that would be my worry versus like, you know, but but I think the greats and, you know, all of these actors we mentioned are great. Yeah. I think they know, OK, you know what? Create the best product over uh, whatever gets me more pages. Yeah. But, but well, well, what about like if, if, if somebody who is writing something and they had a, and they had this project? Yeah. Well, if they approached you and they said, hey, I want to sit down, I want to hash out your character more. What do you think this character is? Like, how would you feel about that? I guess that? I like, think that that happens all the time. Um, that's not unusual, I guess, if maybe for film, but like that's pretty much how plays and character development works. Yeah, but the, but like the plays are already written. Yeah, <clears throat> but you fill in a bunch of stuff. So if someone comes up to you and like asks you about it, you can talk about it, not expecting to get any more or any less. If someone tells you a little bit about this person, it's the same as like every actor when you get sides for an audition or something. You only get so much about a character and you kind of have to make up the rest unless you're right. told. So if someone came in and asked you what you thought about it and what you created, you should have mm-hmm. you should have that based off the little they get you. And then they can adjust it and tweak it and be like, actually think about something this way or add in this factor or the fact that they're a single mom or anything. So right. to me, it's not that weird of a situation. Um, it's a collaborative process. It seems like they how they made this movie, and between how he did approach the actors and get their positions, but I think it's because he had very talented people who can create lives off tiny segments of information. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that out of this world or anything. I think that I think I think it's I don't. I think it happens less than you would think. You know, it happens with I mean, with the really good ones, and when you can really trust, yeah. and you have developed as he has a trust with all of these mm-hmm. actors. And the way I was to understand it, he actually, <clears throat> when he was doing his rewrites, he actually said, "Okay, so I have this character. How do you think?" Like to me, like within the script process, you know, you, you write a script. Boom! Here's my script. It gets picked up. It's going to be made into a movie. And the director or producer or somebody might come up to the actor, actress or come up to you and say, okay, this is your character. This is who, you know, you audition for this character. And then maybe as the movie goes along, you know, there are always rewrites being done, you know, and, and actor, actress could bring their thoughts, their feelings yeah. to it as it's being done. Yeah. But it's rare that it happens before. It's rare that True, and that's before just because going these people had all worked cameras. together before and knew each other and But in a sense they like Jennifer Lawrence had never like they were all from separate things. Like Bradley Cooper wasn't in the fighter. Whereas, True. you know, and, and so they they hadn't really some of them had worked together in certain sense, but they like like I just said, like Christian Bale never worked with uh Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. But Jennifer so. Lawrence and Christian Bale weren't sitting there creating characters and creating a story they were working with their director so you only really needed that person to be connected to everyone beforehand and I mean I don't know I think that that did work in some ways because I felt like there was a lot of expectations put on these people especially after Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence were nominated last year and got awards and everyone says like you need to like make sure you keep your next movie or your next drama is really gonna you have to prove that you deserved it or whatnot. Right. And I don't think in any way the acting hurt any of their careers. I think they all did a really good job. They fleshed it out. For me, this is going to be one of my problems. That role was written for Jennifer Lawrence. He says that. He said he envisioned mm-hmm. her from the beginning. And to me, I love her. I think she does a phenomenal job. I think that her scenes are great. But I honestly felt that as a person, she was too young for this role. Um, it stuck out to me the whole time that she wasn't anywhere near the same age group as the rest of them. And to me, it also, it, Amy Adams was great and looked beautiful, but it made Amy Adams look really old. And on certain in certain instances, I felt like Amy Adams was playing almost like her mother instead of the, the, mistress. the mistress to this woman. And it, it was something that pulled me out almost every time because I was like, 
Well, it certainly defies a convention because you would think if you're going to nine year old kid, if you're going to cheat on anybody, you know, you would be with (laughs) Amy Adams cheating with on her with Jennifer Lawrence because she's the you know the young one, the young one. It just pulled me out of like a belief, and like I, and I, I loved her for like the talent, and she really gave so much to the role. And it's not to say that it's just that in the casting, I was like, you, I would have picked someone older. Or, like, for me, this could have been a play, and she could have played it because you could kind of mess with age more on stage. But in film, where people are so used to accuracy and, like, I don't know, things being real when it comes to, like, age or looks or type or whatever, to me, she stuck out every time. And I'll counter that with a couple of things. A, what I've always found great about Jennifer Lawrence as an actress, especially after watching The Silver Linings Playbook, is... I always find, I'm always more astounded as to how young she actually is. I think as an actress, she's well beyond her years as an actress. A, I think in this movie, again, I was like, she was amazing. And I'm like, she is so, at this point in her career, um, to me, she is so above like a Katniss Everdeen. Like she is a phenomenal actress that can get any role at this point in her career and that she i mean she's just amazing to me every time i see her the live and let die scene i thought it was just awesome the scenes that she had with amy adams i thought was great um you know it was a hard line for me like she was either dumb or really really smart and manipulative and to me that was a fine line the other thing is i think because of her age and looking the way she did it further impact or it further puts forth that she's not meant for him like however she obviously had a kid while she was young uh and 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 i think that Within the within the context of this story, because we know, as you see, or I, I at least gather it, Christian Bale's character with Amy Adams was the right fit, the right match. And that for whatever the purpose is, however Jennifer Lawrence's character and, uh, and, Christian, and Christian Bale's character get together, it's not a right match. And that character, Christian Bale's character, in fact, has one of the, the great lines in the movie where he said, maybe she was just my karma for treating people so poorly, around, you know, before. Yeah. And I was like, I love that. So her age thing didn't See, to me, it just, hit me at all. It just pulled me out because on top of the fact that like, she has this kid who I can't tell how old he is, but she must have had him when she was like, very, very young teenager. But then on top of this, you have that they had this whole history of how they got together and how he saved her. And then somehow, after he obviously had a loving relationship with her and adopted her son, and all this time passed between them, then he developed this whole new relationship with Sydney, and they had this whole life and this whole scheme in all these years, and then it fell down the toilet, and now they're in this situation. I'm like, where is that chunk of time in Jennifer Lawrence's age? It doesn't mathematically make sense, and I don't understand. Yeah, but you don't know how old she is. I mean, they never give her age. You're just saying that she looks young, but you never know. They never give an age at all as to what she is, and if you wanted to, I mean, you could extrapolate from the kid looked like he was seven, eight, maybe. I don't know. Exactly. I don't know. But, and I also get the sense that he married her to save more of the kid. He oh, seemed no. to more love the I, kid, and he adopted the kid I because, you know, that was his. I do get that. Just to me, if they, if he has such a history with her and such a history with Sydney, that takes time, and these rela- relationships needed to go through their own cycles, and it didn't. Ma- so that's why I didn't believe it because I was just like, "How did she spend all these years? Where where are they? She's too young." Yeah, she I did, did a it. great job. Like they oh. gave her a character, and she embraced it, and like full heartedly did great acting. I'm not saying anything against her performance. I'm saying. It should have been given to someone older, in my opinion. Yeah, I I disagree. I thought she mm-hmm. nailed it for uh, whatever age she was playing. I mean, a lot of people would agree with Dimitri mm-hmm. on this one. Um, I I side a little Definitely. bit, with Sarah, but I, I want to know this. Um, going back to kind of the script level, and but this does affect the actors, of course. Mm-hmm. Who do you? Who are you supposed to root for in this movie? I ask because in Civil Linings Playbook, right? You know, you root for Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper. Um. In in the fighter, 
you know, you're kind of following Mark Wahlberg's character more or less, and then everyone, it, it, it seems where where everyone in in those movies ends up well. In I Heart Huckabees, it's kind of you know what I mean. You're, it's a crazy journey, but you're kind of following um, the not the couple, but the, the detectives. Right. Let's keep I Heart Huckabees like let's, 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 um, let's, let's tack it up because I wanted to bring that up at some point during this, but I think you pose you a great question. Anyone? I initially was rooting for Bradley Cooper's character. Maybe that's okay. Interesting. Okay. And but and but it threw me off because you know again just from from the way it was told and I don't know if this was on the script level or it, you know they brought it in and post with the voiceover. Um, you know, obviously we have like a ten minute voiceover between uh, Christian Bale and Amy Adams right. of their kind of backstory and things like that. Um, and they're essentially the bad guys. But even okay. if for me, even if you're supposed to root for them, there was nothing that that Bradley Cooper's character did to me that was so offensive and wrong because morally he was right apart from okay beating up his boss but I you know, but I think okay. even more well, this is great and I think this is great discussion because yeah we should do a character breakdown and what you thought but you first because you have some thoughts and then I'll get into who I think you're supposed to be following and quote unquote rooting for but okay so this is both one of my problems with me and one of my biggest compliments. What I really loved is how that they, they really did change the typical expectation of who you are supposed to be rooting for and who you develop, like, I guess, feelings for in a way. Because you have your, how do I phrase this? You have your bad guys, your crooks, who you end up trying to understand and I feel like they're trying to get you almost on their side and rooting for them by the end then you have Bradley Cooper who's playing like your cop and typically you're supposed to love the cop inside of the cop because he's going for justice and they make you dislike him and then you have all the politicians who they make you understand why they're going out of their way they don't make them bad guys I feel like they switched around who the typical villains are and who the typical heroes are and they kind of muddled everything up and I thought that's a good feat to like go against the stereotype of average film is wonderful but even you know but like you said the only thing I really stuck to was like okay so I just want Christian Bale and Amy Adams to end up together yeah because you know, that's the only running through thing that I can find typically, so that's what I'm well, gonna decide with typically and, and I'll let you speak to me too right after this but you you can typically again you can root for the quote the good guys or the bad guys can become the, the good guys, guys. But they made the bad guys the good guys and they made the good guys the bad guys. But you can do that, but it needs to be very clear. I mean, um, I'm trying to think of a great example um, of I how to do that. I think they did do that. Yeah. I what mean, are your thoughts, Dimitri? Well, my thoughts are it's, 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 a very interesting, it's a very interesting year as far as movies go and who you're going to follow. I couldn't, as I was watching American Hustle, I couldn't, not think about inside Lewin Davis because right now we'll have two movies out there in which your lead character isn't isn't necessarily the good guy <clears throat> but I think as far as American Hustle goes you know if you're going to break down archetypes you know who your good guys your bad guys are yes the police should be the good guy these are the con men your politicians or whatever but I think how what David O. Russell does is he fashions this in such a way where, number one, it opens up with Christian Bale. Mm -hmm. You get his history. And his whole history is about he'd rather be the taker than the take than being taken. He'd rather be the guy. And with his father, his father was taken and stuff. And he didn't want to do that. So he began conning or scamming at a young age and doing whatnot. And then we meet Amy Adams, who is escaping. Again, you're looking at two people who are trying to escape a life that they had. And they created a whole new life. Yeah. to do this and you know Amy Adams being one of them so meeting at the beginning and how they met they were actually again with every scene that I see with Christian Bill and Amy Adams I see this a real budding true relationship so and love going and I think you're supposed to follow these characters because they're the ones who sort of kind of have the arc by the end of the movie they actually look they they say we got to we got to get out of this we have to mm -hmm. change and at the end they actually they, they, they leave that behind and they become 
parents. They become the responsible adults. They get out of, they change for the better life. And I think with Christian Bale's character, I think it's seen throughout the entire movie that he cons, he specifically, he cons people. Like he says, the people who are coming to me are the people who, who are not going to go to the banks because of legitimacy. Like I'm conning people who are already like not good people. And you could also tell with his relationship with uh, Polito, with um, uh, Hurt Locker guy, Jeremy Renner. Uh, Jeremy Renner's I just character. Him in the Avengers. That, so that's my. I'm you sorry. know, with I'm with, like, what are you talking about? Avengers. Which, yeah, when you have Carmine Polito by Jeremy, you know, he's he is a politician that has a good heart, but he's making he's making decisions that he feels are the for the betterment and, of the people and the audience. Doesn't and think he's doing anything wrong. Not necessarily, but he is. And Christian Bale has the heart. And when he says, you're the best friend I've ever had, he's not lying. He, You could see in certain scenes, but in one scene in particular, where Polito is with his cronies and he's going, this guy Irving is going to save Jersey. He's going to do it. He's going to get the chic out here. And Christian Bale's like having a hard time looking him in the eye. So are you rooting knows. for Christian Bale? Absolutely. Okay. You are because you're rooting for are their Are you rooting for him or are you rooting for their relationship? You're their love. For both. I mean, you're rooting for both these people to come on because to me, Bradley Cooper's character as... Um, as as Richie D'Amato or D'Amaso, he was a douche. The only thing he was looking for was limelight, power, but yet he was an eight year old. Like he did it so childishly, and like he never gave respect to his boss, and he was just a douche about it all. And he, so to me, he was never. When he gets his comeuppance, I, he gets exactly what he deserves. And I think that's why also you like it so much because from the very beginning you knew who you were kind of siding with, which is like Phil. He was always he was rooting for the guy who everyone ends up disliking. Therefore, you're going to be unhappy in a way. But what I want to say is like, it's true. I was rooting for their relationship from the very beginning, and I wasn't seeing this as a con movie. I was seeing it as okay, we've got people who are supposed to be together who have been pulled apart who are going to get back together. But then I also was like, halfway through, I knew the ending, so it allowed certain things to lag. In certain points because what was carrying me through was a love story in a mob movie okay does that make sense sure because i mean in a sense it is but to me again you're forgetting about the themes of redemption you're you know both of these people they needed to reinvent themselves and, I guess I and they was... needed and they needed a redemption they needed to redeem themselves they knew that what they were doing was not good they got caught at it and see i they liked them already i liked them i wasn't so i didn't need as much redemption and i also knew it was coming so much that i was kind of yeah and i didn't know that it was coming because when they're putting this thing together like mm -hmm. the, there are a couple of scenes and you know uh you know there's that they're together, they're apart, mm -hmm. and then they slowly start to get back together again mm -hmm. where Christian Bale's character sort of has the epiphany and he says, I should have listened to you. You know, we should have ran and we should have taken... She goes, no. She goes, yeah, I said that. I said that to do this. She goes, we have to put this over on everyone. Mm -hmm. We have to put this over on everyone. And he's like, yes, we have to do the best that we've ever done because it's the only way we're going to get out of this, get it behind us and start a life. And the way that everything was manipulated to the end where Jennifer Lawrence says, I want a divorce instead of when Christian Bale said he wanted the divorce and how they had everything set in time so that when everything came down at the end and, and again, Christian Bale's Irving goes to see Polito to tell him, look, I, I got to be straight up with you. And two people say, look, I have to be real with you. Amy Adams says it to Bradley Cooper and she mm -hmm. loses the accent. And she goes, I got to be real with you. Christian Bale goes to Polito and says, I have to be real with you. And that was a very hard scene for me. It was hard because it was emotional. And I was like, oh, my God. And he knew he was going to lose this friendship. And he was I felt that that character of Irving was really hurt because he was going to lose his best friend. And he even says, mm -hmm. I lost my and friend. And I'm not saying that I didn't feel those parts because I did. And there were some beautiful, beautiful scenes. There's also some 
golden moments mm. in this film that I I love just to name one like when uh, Bradley Cooper is holding her sh- her foot mm-hmm. and she's sitting oh, yeah. on the counter and he's just <laughs> holding her foot yeah wonderful um, that, sorry that's completely off track of what I was saying um, <laughs> I got totally distracted no but back to the love story and what they're saying I already knew recognized that they both had the potential to really care about someone because they cared about each other mm-hmm. so when he goes to Polito and is like I want to be your like I, you were my friend I want to be honest with you and she goes to Bradley Cooper and is like I want to drop this I kind of already knew they had the potential to have emotions and have relationships and to be real because we'd already seen it. So I wasn't surprised. I wasn't like, oh, to me, that wasn't that big of an arc because they weren't self, comp- they were selfish people in the beginning, but they still had feelings for each other and let each, each other well, no, in. And I don't know. No, I mean, but but what, what happens is, is that together they grow. I mean, they grow, they realize, uh, or Christian or Irving realizes, listen, I can't go on. Like, Mm -hmm. she's the one for me. And as far as, you know, and as far as Amy Adams goes, what's what's great about her and the dialogue, I think, in the movie is that from the get-go, she says, listen, if we're going to do this, I'm going to get very close to this guy, very close to this guy. You have to be all right with it. Because I didn't for one minute ever think... I think she might have been taken a little bit by his wily ways, but I don't think she fell for him at all. She was playing him, and she knew, and she couldn't get too close. And, you know, she it's just Christian. She was just so good at it that even Christian Bale was getting jealous. Here's my question, though. Sorry. Go ahead. ahead, Well, uh, you know, early on in the movie... Uh, she says, you know, we, we haven't slept together. And then we kind of come back to that point and you're like, okay, did they, you know, uh, there's always that wonder, are they going to sleep together now? And they still at no point do it. No. And that's why, at the, you know, when she reveals this, uh, you know, I have an accent thing, he just gets so frustrated over that aspect of it. Like, <laughs> why can't I bed you? Yeah. Um, for me, Bradley Cooper's character, one of the, I think it's interesting because Yes, he has a lot of bad traits, but ultimately he does just want justice. And I think he's he's a man in a world he just can't keep up. And uh, the great scene when uh, Christian Bale takes him to the paintings and, you know, like there's a fake painting. And so I think he's just coming to terms with the fact that all of life is unreal or this and that. And he just doesn't know how to comprehend it. It frustrates him. Well, in interviews, Bradley Cooper describes him as kind of like a 15-year-old kid. Yeah. He's just like this child that's kind of trying to go up in the world. Um, but my question is about Sydney's relationship to him or, um, is how he fooled her in the first place and got to her to like drop her card and bring him into the meeting for the loans. Because they talk about and they make a point to be like, something's in the way, your emotions are in the way, two lunches, you didn't need two lunches, like what's going on with you? And because she's been so drawn in by him, she lets her guard down, which is why she hands him the money. And then it's a little muddled where that gets, I don't know. So she liked him at first, realized she's bad, and then all of those flirtatious feelings actually drop, but she fakes them. Well, what scene in particular are you talking about that gives him the money? Well, Re- remember um, that's when she gets, when she gets hot. hot. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's he hands her the check. Yes. Or he hands the check. And the she accepts she, the yeah, check. And the reason that she does that is because she's been so taken in by him and her right. interviews with him. Right. She she trusts him. Yes. And But yet, at the same time, too, you know, note that Bradley Cooper is still trying to play one on her. It was a very interesting mm-hmm. thing that he said to her, he goes, you know, he's using you. He goes, why didn't he take the check? He knew. He knew something was wrong. He let you take the check. He let you take the fall. My thing is, if you notice the cons before, he was accepting checks. He was like literally grabbing onto yeah, checks left and, and right. He, realized he just felt he didn't he, have the time to go, don't like what's going oh, on here. No, it, like, I think he did. He noticed something was off and right. she didn't know something was off because she was taken in by him. And But before he could do anything, because you see that he clearly can see something's off. Mm-hmm. And he stands up. She's standing a little bit ahead of him. And she just goes ahead and grabs the check. Uh-huh. And she takes the check because I agree with you that 
she was taken and she believed him. So everybody was trying to con everybody. And she took the check, and then she ended up in the slammer. I mean, he kept her there for three days. I kept the. I mean, he was still playing her. And as far as his, where, I like you. What stuff, do you think her emotional attachment tracked throughout this film is? At first, she's in love with Christian Bale. She's right. in love with Christian Bale. She has a little flirtatious encounter with this guy, so she drops her guard, ends up in jail. Right. And then. And then I believe that then the con is on. Mm-hmm. I believe that. And where you does know, she, she stand emotionally? Because she's kind of been messed up. And well, he played with her. I think emotionally, to be honest, the way I took it, and I could be completely off. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I took it is, she this guy loves Christian Bale. Absolutely, mm-hmm. she she loves him mm-hmm. like to an, to a point where it's unequivocal. She's she, mm-hmm. but she knows that he's married. She's got to get rid of that. But again, this cop guy mm-hmm. is a guy that scammed her. Yeah. And she wants, again, the way I viewed it, she'll do anything to try to get back. She does not look. She knows okay. this guy's a dunce. Okay. So and it was just the only emotional played, connection she ever think, had to him was before she found out she was accused of cop when it was just a flirtation. He was a means thing. of that she could use him and she even said yeah, yeah i'm she, i'm gonna make him so fall in love and we're gonna keep him because in case we need him for another yeah, play yeah. No, I and christian that. bill's like we won't need another play she goes we're gonna need another play and i think in the back of her mind you know she had to i think that there was something that she there was an attractiveness mm-hmm. to you know i i think that that was there i just think that that character in the back of her mind said look i can't let this I'm not going to let him get in. I got to do whatever I can. I'll pretend. I mean, the scene in the bathroom, to me, said it all. I mean, that was a primal scream. Oh, you liked the primal scream? Yeah. I mean, to me, that because that was the first time that she said, we're not going to fuck now. Mm-hmm. We're going to do it when this is re- we're going to do it when this is all done and blah 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 mm-hmm. and that's keeping him at bay and but he's just like I mean they're in a bathroom stall and he has a dress up and like and everyone's this, screaming what are you doing like, that scene was great she goes like, this is fucking real she goes I fucking really have to go to the bathroom <laughs> like all the people are like, would you hurry up and get up already the scene was great and at the same time when she finally gets him out she's like what a, I just think it's just a release of oh my god what am I doing, okay. what am I getting myself like holy cow because I I completely agree with you that I thought she lo- she liked Christian Bale the whole time like I always felt that she loved him all the way through so to me I was always just like does she just I was a little bit confused with her initial flirtation mm-hmm. with Bradley Cooper's character before she got caught. Gotcha. That wine she was flirting with him when they had such a wonderful, epic love. I didn't know if it was like him just overacting or if she really did have this flirtatious attraction to him. And that confused mm-hmm. me just a little bit because I was like, if she can go back to him and love Christian Bale so thoroughly and they're supposed to be the one true match, like, why did she need to flirt with this? Yeah. Guy, he's not all that great. And, and remember, too, it, to me, what, what's great about David O. Russell's script is that they both sort of come to this mm-hmm. conclusion together. They sort of come to this, like, yeah, which which is what I really love. And they know that they, mm-hmm. together, that they are great. That they do actually, they and, have the same, and, you know, And I, I love their relationship. And, yeah. I love their relationship. Music, yeah. great. Yeah. Just their their chemistry, their, their little, like, story yeah. i really did love. what are your thoughts we haven't really given you much time sorry no that. no worries <laughs> um you know to me in terms of how it opened up i love the way that it opened up with uh i mean it was for what it was it was a bit lengthy in terms of him setting up his hair mm-hmm. and, and i thought that was a good way to basically visually say everything about this guy is fake what i really want i'm oh, sorry can i ask you again well you know what i really wanted to happen the whole time, I really wanted them to hide a wire in his toupee. <laughs> I wanted to happen so bad because they made why? Because so, was... they made such a big deal about this, like his comb over and like little thing in there. And they're like, "Where are we gonna hide this wire?" And then a pioneer purse. But I just, I wanted it to be in his hair so <laughs> bad. 
I was like, please. That's funny. Please put it in his hair because it would just be great. <laughs> but they didn't. But they didn't. And I was let down. You know, and I, I just, I also thought the, um, the story telling technique was uh, interesting where they start there you know we start timeline wise kind of in the middle of things sure mm-hmm. then go back and continue from there i thought that was interesting um what i liked about it is immediately after um you know in that scene of like don't touch his hair it takes him a long time you know and i loved knowing kind of again looking back on it knowing the timeline and the order of events in their worlds i like that because she's still sticking up for him right mm-hmm. you know and, and, and it shows that she really does understand yeah him. and or, what or did you think about that with... scene actually because that's a really it's an interesting kids to me that scene that's where i was sold christian bale he spent all this time and as christian bale has said he goes this guy's supposed to be a great con man he ain't conning anybody with that hair like that just ain't happening mm-hmm. and that whole scene because he just lays it lets it all out you see the gut you see the cowlick you see the hair he's putting on the glue it's a, it's a process and when so he and he comes out and automatically he's like yeah you've been with my girl it's oh so that's what this is about and and he, he's like don't touch me he goes you know and she's yeah he doesn't like to be touched he goes doesn't like to be you mean if i wanted to humiliate you i would do this and when he did that i was like even i was like huh. it's like yeah. it was he looked ludicrous but christian bale's slope like his thing like i thought he was going to explode he just stood there and i was like oh my head but and it was for me that was sucked in right there. And to your point, I think you're right. Amy Adams is like, she was pissed off at great Bradley scene, Cooper. Yeah. Great scene. Yeah. Visually, dialogue, everything great, but gives away the whole movie. You can dissect the whole movie out of the scene. You know what's going to happen. You know that she still loves him. You know that she's going to be on his side. You know that Bradley Cooper is the one who the- goes over the top and that he's the one who can contain himself and it's going to plan all the way through. But here's the thing. It's a obviously like I it's just knew where everything was going to end up. But it's a choice because at that point it's dramatic irony. You know, why do you yeah. like mo- watching movies a second time? Sometimes mm-hmm. they're better than the first is because, you know, yeah. it's just the journey of getting there. And to me it was. I mean, again, I can't say that I knew where this movie was going. I actually thought like, you know, watching the movie the first time, I actually said, "Jesus. I go this thing like this con is going to I go if it were con- like almost a conventional thing, that con would have gone bad. And then it would be, how do we get out of this mess? Yeah. But how things worked out, you're like, I didn't see that end coming. I, guess, I didn't that- see the con. I didn't see the con coming. And then how Bradley Cooper got his comeuppance, I didn't see coming. But it was awesome the way that it did. And yeah, for me, like that end, like the ending was for me it was great and to david o russell's point that's how he when you think about his movies and you let's silver linings great, great ending movie. right great but it movie. didn't have a very satisfying ending i mean because wasn't there at least one time where you thought maybe they weren't gonna get together throughout like maybe it was gonna take that route and be the sad love story instead of the happy love story but it was the happy love story they ended up together same thing with the fighter with amy adams like you don't exactly know. Maybe now, if David O. Russell makes another movie, maybe I'll I'll go into it with, you it's know, the rose cover. Maybe maybe he'll try to do something different. But, uh, you know, the fighter again when, you know, with Mark Wahlberg reuniting with his family and the the relationship he has with Amy Adams, you know, it just really works. And uh, and again, you have you have two in the fighter. You had two redemptions. You had Christian Bale's the drug addict brother. You had Mark Wahlberg coming into the ring and 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 you know doing mm-hmm. what he had to do. And I wouldn't even I say Amy Adams because and Amy Adams what I loved too. about sure. that movie, you know, he says to her like, "What have I fought, Sugar Ray? What have you ever done besides bartended?" Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know what I mean. That, but that's a whole different movie. You're um, right. Yeah. Maybe we should do the trilogy. I mean, those are two great movies worthy of talking about. Just the Coronado trilogy. Yeah, well, you know, but that's what I was thinking of. It was, in a sense, I thought the same thing when I was doing my notes. So this is like a, a different Coronado tra- tra- trilogy. I mean, there is there are common themes, and David O. Russell says, yeah, that they can be considered a, a, a trilogy only because of their 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 themes. And yeah, when I watch it, yeah, absolutely. What I like, you know, going back to the beginning, what I loved about it is that 
you know, it set it up. And, and again, knowing what we know now, uh, just Bradley, he is like a 15 year old kid because he, you know, he moves the, the suitcase and it's like, dude. And part of the whole thing is, you know, had, had you just let, um, Christian Bale's character take control, not messed him up. Cause that obviously threw him off his element. He was now angry at you and he wasn't as willing to fix things. Things might've gone better right off the start. Right. But you moved the suitcase. Yeah. You, and, you know, to, and it just, it all went, it all went south. Yeah. It to an extent. All went south before that. So and it's just because I think I think in that moment that sealed Bradley Cooper's fate. Yeah. Well, you the other interesting thing is you got to know that character because that took place at the beginning of the movie, and then when you again starting from the midway point, so to speak. But as you got to see Bradley Cooper's character, well, of course he was going to push the case. Like yeah. you get you understand why more. Mm -hmm. um, and but again, even the way a fact. Aside from the fact that he beat the shit out of his boss, okay, I mean, he never let his boss finish the ice fishing story. And it was funny to me because I don't know why, but I sort of kind of cared. First off, Louis C.K. has been in two movies this year, um, Blue Jasmine, and in this movie, and both times I was like, is this Louis C.K.? I mean, I thought he did really good in this movie. Really well. Right? I mean, really he was well. really good. And when he started well. telling the ice fishing story... I remember because the first time he said it, he says it was it was like mid October. The ice was thin and blah blah. He goes, "Oh, so you're trying to save me? You know, you don't want me to fall through thin ice?" He goes, "No, that's not it. All right," and he just leaves. When he picks up the ice story fishing again, he goes, "He goes, oh, you got to finish that story." And and uh, Louis C.K. is like, "Where did I leave off?" I said, "Mid October, thin ice." He goes, "Oh, it was a blizzard. It was a blizzard. and I was like, "What?" And then you just got that Bradley Cooper was not paying attention whatsoever. And, you know, that, I mean, he was just such a douche, like, throughout the movie. And he's like, oh, so you want to do it? He goes, no, that's not the point. Goes, All right, whatever. And he kept on walking out on him. You yeah, know? you're right. You're correct in the sense that it, it is very ironic because later, as they're being, rep after he beats him up and they're being reprimanded together, um, he goes, well, you were a great mentor to me. <laughs> Still want to know, and I, I believe he says, I, "I still want to know the ending to the that, ice fishing story." Ice fishing story. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, in order to have a mentor, you have to accept their mentorship, right? So I thought, yes, you're correct in that yeah. irony. It's it's just it was just your great. mentor also needs to not hate you or beat I don't you think, up. Here's the, I, I don't think <laughs> beat I, you up with the phone or, or pull a gun out on you. <laughs> Well, that was that was that was the uh, mentor. -y. Yeah, but I, I think I, I think Louis C.K.'s character didn't hate him. He was frustrated with him and thought he was going about it the wrong way. But until he got beat up, I don't think he was, you know, so much more enamored. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think he sort of kind of could see potential, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, he was just going off the page. He was doing whatever he felt that he needed to get done, and he wanted to be because there was even a part where he's talking to him and he goes i'm in charge of this opera you go he, he, you know he said yeah i need this for this operation and it's my you know i need this for my operation he's like this isn't your operation <laughs> like there was, a, there was a but he was the, he became bradley cooper's what i liked about that is that he became kind of everyone's you know uh pet and and, and a way to get stuff it was like okay well we need 10 million dollars and so at that point it what no matter what it was never his operation because they were like Dude, we need we need the suite and we need the we need ten right. million dollars. Dude, I need ten million dollars. Like, yeah. no, you're not calling any shots. Yeah. Go I ahead, what say. I liked about the ice fishing aspect was that every time he guessed the ending, it was kind of where you expected it to go. And right. It was very like <laughs> accurate. And there was the frustration, like, well, no, that's not my story. I'm going to change it in my head because I want you to be wrong. No, I think no, I actually think that to Lucy's character louis ck's character i think he was like no that's not what i was gonna say i was going to bring this up and he, you know and then he even comes a point where he goes my brother died okay <laughs> and you're like and yeah bradley cooper doesn't care yeah. <laughs> you he's know? like years after but <laughs> and when you look at the relationship too it's funny because you look at that relationship and then you look at the relationship between irving and and polito and that relationship was a to me that was like a solid like relationship, I mean, one of the best scenes it was that night that they went out. With the wives? The, the Delilah. See, oh, I mean, Delilah you know, and, and like actually seeing uh, Christian Bill do the uh, 
you know, he did the gopher dance, sort of kind of from Caddyshack. He's like doing this. I mean, that was great. But then when they end up in the diner the next morning, and he goes, hey, I got a gift for you. <laughs> and he opens up the trunk of his car. He goes, here, it's it's science. It's a microwave. He goes, it heats up food. It can heat up lasagna, pasta. He's like, you bought this for me? And I'm thinking, bought it? It seems like it probably fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> but he's like, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it just, that sealed the, and, and to Christian Bale, he's like, wow, I, I it's almost like I have a friend and it's like, you could tell he's never had any true friends because of the life that he chose to be. He never had true friends. And he, I think he really enjoyed spending his time with, you know, with, um, with that character with, with Polito. But again, it just, it, it was a nice point where he had to get his life in order. Um, you know, again, he was never really true. He wasn't true with him. And so while right. this friendship, was a good friendship uh just you know in terms of the microwave what's funny is that okay the microwave is fake because it's you know now it's you know what you want to poison us you want to poison us you bring poison into here and then it starts fires like look what he did (laughs) and then he wants her at the dinner he's like you gotta come of course why 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 wouldn't she come she's gotta come he's like what do you got a girlfriend on the side i understand these things but you know but it going that that to me is like the jennifer lawrence conundrum that i had She's either, again, I I said, she's either really stupid or she's very smart. And by stupid, it's like, oh, mommy started a fire. How did that happen? Well, did you know that there's sun and lamps? And she left this. And I was like, even I was trying to put that together. I completely forgot. But it was a freaking tanning lamp that caused the fire. And it's like, what idiot? You just go idiot. And then when he says, don't put metal in the microwave. She puts the biggest slab on. Huh? She puts and like. She's saying it out loud. Out loud. Don't put metal in the microwave. Don't put metal in the microwave. You know, and then but she turns the argument around to her when she says these things sap out all the nutrients. You know, and but at the same time, um, when she talks to her mob boyfriend, and she says, "Well, he's on the phone with somebody from the IRS," was that stupidity? Or was that just plain old flat out manipulation that she knew that Irving was gonna? I think she was smarter than she appeared to be. I think so. I, I think so. What do you think? Or do you think she was just so stupid she didn't think? Like I don't think she was so stupid. I think that. I (laughs) sounds horrible. Um, (laughs) I I I think that you can kind of be both. Mm-hmm. Um, there are those people I met who, who literally like really smart and like while they're telling you about like neuroscience and all these crazy things they're like simultaneously with the other hand like about to stick their fingers in a socket <laughs> and you're like you're like right. this doesn't work but somehow you're the same person yeah so I think I think she was definitely both <laughs> but at the same time her confrontation with Amy Adams character mm-hmm. like was anything but stupid like mm-hmm. it was a calculated her words were, her actions are very calculated and even amy adams like they they, they talk about let's look, the kiss mm, the kiss in the bathroom huge, like, yeah. and that apparently was although i, I can't quite figure out amy adams idea it was either amy adams idea. jennifer for how she executed it yeah and david o russell's like well yeah jennifer lawrence you know but that scene, like Amy Adams is like that laugh afterwards as she walks away is just so maniacal. It <laughs> devastated me. <laughs> and, you know, in that way, she gets the upper hand. Mm-hmm. And that scene was so it was above caddy. It was like vicious. And it, it was such a great scene together. And yeah. I mean, you know, and ironically, she's at, right. She wanted to be there early on in the movie. She said, you know, right. it's. To, to gain whatever she needs. So, you know I don't like to go out. Yeah. You love to go out. You love to go out. It just doesn't benefit you. Right. Um, let's talk about the di- uh, let's talk about the different characters. I definitely want to talk about Robert De Niro. Well, let's talk about the oh. Sheik, though. I want to talk about the Sheik. <laughs> um, what did you guys think of him just as a plot device and then as an actor? Michael Pena? Yeah. Well, as, as the Sheik, not the first guy who's from Brooklyn <laughs> I sell siding. <laughs> that guy with Michael yeah. Pena's character. Yeah. What, what happened to my guy? What happened to my guy? Yeah. So this is like based off a true story somewhat. You can say your line, you know, somebody's yeah. blah, 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 blah. And they did use a sheik and they did use multiple people in the FBI yeah. to play him. So I thought that 
for me, it worked because it did pull from real life. And, like, I liked the Sheik as a device. I, But part of me was convinced because it was part of the true story. I What I liked about it was um, w- the age that lended itself to so much comedy is, like, A, this isn't my guy. B, this is how shitty your guy is. Right. Like, he does not... First off, he's Mexican. He's Mexican. <laughs> Uh, B, does he know how to speak it? No, he doesn't. Oh, my God. He know I know Salam Aleikum <laughs> and a couple of other phrases. He's like, what are you? But, it, but it's true to Christian Bale's um, real frustration. If we're going to do, you have to, you have to, you have to be more convincing than what is real. You have to do it from the feet up. Yeah. 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 And yeah, if the dude can't even speak, right. we got a problem. But, but, you know, it led to, it led to a great scene. Oh, and you did. were going to talk to about De Niro. Yes. And it led to an amazingly tense scene. Because, you know, from my perspective, well, well you know, and I, we'll speak to Robert, but um, what I loved about it is that's when the first moment of, like, uh, because all this time, uh, Christian Bale's character is telling you, again, you have to be more real than real. And, dude, because you didn't listen to me, it could all fall apart, and it's not on me, it's on you. Right. Yeah, and as things play out, like even in the Overvoice, like who would have known we were dealing with a mobster that spoke Arabic? Like yeah. who, who would have ever known that? Obviously, throughout throughout his time of being a con man, the whole Sheik deal was definitely a an Irving device. I mean, he was using a Sheik to 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 get his deals done, whether it be an art scam or whatever. So he knew how to do this, he and Amy Adams. And they were like, well, I just need to use an FBI guy. Yeah, he's Mexican, he'll pass. And he's like, no, he goes, give me the knife. That scene with the knife and explaining to him, like, this knife is like your light. Like, you're handing this over. And I just love the way that it's shot. It right. And he actually hands over the knife. It's so like, and I was like. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> oh, this is not going to end well. But when they get, so many things could have gone drastically wrong when they went to that casino yeah. place between Jennifer Lawrence's character approaching the mob people and Amy Adams' glance was just like, you are going to ruin, you're going to get us killed and then going into the private room. And on top of that, you're a horrible wife. Right. <laughs> and on top I know of it why, all. <laughs> why he should leave you. <laughs> yeah. Rosalind. But yeah, that scene is... that. You're right. That that scene really is telling as to how much Bradley Cooper doesn't know. And he's just trying to force it. Yeah. You, you know, if you're going to do, you have to you have to be real slick. Yeah. What did you like about the scene, Sarah? About what, about the Robert De Niro scene in the back yeah. room where they have the thought. Is that when the flashback happens of him shooting someone in the street? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was waiting for someone to get killed this whole movie, so I was glad that was in there. Oh. And I, Isn't that nice? <laughs> Glad that scene paid off. <laughs> well, you know, they, they, um, they showed that scene in the trailer. And not to, not to interrupt, but in the trailer, I, you know, I never had a hint that Robert De Niro was in this movie. And yeah. that scene is in quickly in the trailer. And I never, and, I would, never yeah, I would have remember. said that that's yeah. Robert De Niro. So, yeah, go ahead. That's, yeah. So um, somebody died and got killed. I like, I like that they brought him in. I like that they brought someone who kind of raised the stakes even more that this wasn't just money and politics but they put their lives in danger and right. they really that whole blame again was falling on bradley cooper's shoulders and they were constantly making him more and more the bad guy yeah that i really enjoyed and it was and i like when you up the stakes and you put it make it more absolutely dramatic it was the way. first time anybody was in a true mm-hmm. jeopardy moment like to your point of upping the stakes this was the time this that scene introduced true life danger, like life threatening kind of danger that could have permeated through. But what, you, what worked was um, at that point, um, you know, their friendship or the con, whatever you want to call it, uh, Christian Bale and Jeremy Renner. You know, Jeremy, he kind of stands up and says, well, everything's good. You know, however right. he says it, everything's good. Like, no, he's, you know, because of knowing what he did. Uh, you know, as as falsely as the knife was handed to him, it's such a big like. This is remember their confrontation. Right. This is fake. This, this is means right. nothing. Yeah, you know. So Very there was sad. such an emphasis put on that stuff, and yeah. so so at that point, you know, that's what kind of did save him. 
was a, Jeremy Renner, obviously the, the direct thing, but um, Christian Bale's manipulation of everything. Yeah, and Christian Bale, too. It was gutsy what he did in that one scene. Because mm-hmm. Christian Bale's like, as soon as they mention, as soon as the De Niro character mentioned, well, and he gave all the right reasons. He's like, look, we can't do this. We got the Olympics. We, you know, we got music. Um, we can't have an Arab. It's very, you know, nobody's going to want to touch this. We got to make an, we have to make him an American citizen. And then he goes, well, that's going to need politicians. And, and Christian Bale's like, you know what? I don't like, more po- like to Christian Bale, this thing is starting to spiral out of so much control that in his head, he's like, what have, what have I gotten myself into with this Bobo? Like now, now we got to bribe politicians. He goes, and right there was that, that light came on. The, the stakes yeah. were raised. Yeah. And, and then De Niro's like, who is this guy? You know, and, and, and but Polito stands up for him yeah. in that scene. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the scene just plays out on so many levels because you had the women outside. Oh, and did you also notice, too, that when Jennifer Lawrence um, approaches the mob guys, did you notice that Polito's wife, who they were really friendly, she sort of, like, backs away from her? She's sort of, like, hands off, like, well, that the, girl's she, crazy. She kind of switches sides. Yeah. She ends up kind of being on Amy Adams' side. Yeah. And they're sitting at the table together in the end because... Right. She represents a good wife. Right. She has a good husband who has somehow put himself in a kind of a sticky right. situation too. But they are a good, solid family. They yeah. make a point of that, of always kind of keeping their households. Why she wants them around. She thinks she's found another good wife. Right. And when she goes over to the bar, she realizes it's it's a window in for her to realize she's not really in the best situation either. Right. And that's why she switches sides. Yeah. I, it was interesting. It was an interesting <laughs> thing. I was like, ooh, she... She's staying away from Jennifer Lawrence well, Jennifer now. Well, Jennifer Lawrence and... threw up some red flags. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and the last kind of character um, that I thought was major that I want to talk about is, um, and shoot, I can't remember his name, but, um, you know, the guy the, the guy who's mediating, um, Louis C.K. and Bradley Cooper. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, the other official who's kind of trying to make a name for himself. Yeah, which, by the way, you know, you, you spoke about how Bradley Cooper's make, trying to make a name for himself. I thought it was interesting because in the narration, that's who Christian Bale said is trying to... So I thought that's... My mind went to that, and that's why initially I didn't think Bradley Cooper was trying to make a name for himself. He was just trying to do the right thing. Right, now, the, yeah, yeah, that, that gentleman is, um, is Alessandro Nivola is the actor's name, uh, and he... Whoops, uh, he played Anthony An- Amato. Uh, Anthony Amato, who in the story was, in a sense, he was a successful Bradley Cooper. He Because it said that he wanted the limelight, and that's why he originally, hey, I want to go with this guy. This guy can get these things done, and he can he can make this big. And, like, and they even said that he was a politician, or he was a... Um, yeah, he was a high state. Yeah, he was a high. Yeah. Uh, he was a high yeah, point politician, he was, but he liked the limelight and he wanted to oh, put things down. Oh, I thought down. he was Lucy K's boss. Mm. It wasn't. <clears throat> no, he. Um, not. I'm so confused. He was in charge. He, of. Uh, I forget what his. his I, th- title I thought. Was. I was thought he was kind of like the intersect between like politics and FBI. I. Th- Something like that, in the sense that he's he's a, you have to report to him. You know how how the FBI and things like that they have to report to an outside um, facility. I, right. I don't know how to word it. Yeah, I, but he wasn't their boss. I don't, he wasn't affiliated with the FBI. I just think you know you eventually have to go to. It's like you have to go if a cop has to get a warrant, you go to a judge. Right. That type of you know it's, yeah. it's on that level. And okay. something interesting about him, uh, he was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Yay. <laughs> Great con artists him. come from Boston. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so what about that character? Were uh, you... I just liked, you know, uh, I thought, you know, him wanting to make a name for himself and things like that. It was, it was interesting the part that he did play by the end. You know, initially there wasn't much given to him. And then by the end, he was a, a very pinnacle person because, you know, as soon as... I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, Louis C.K. and Bradley Cooper got suspended. And it's like, okay, all decisions go through me. We're doing this. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I they think, did it. I yeah. think we should talk about the style of this film. Wait, but did, mean, did we want to talk about De Niro at all? 
Because I knew you wanted to. Well, I, th- I think we did okay. in, the, in that sense. I mean, obviously, this was no Silver Linings playbook for no. him. But it was nice to see him based that you know, and, and I thought, again, not a great role. But it, but finally, you know, we're still seeing great acting from him. Intimidating as hell. Yeah. Still. Like, yeah. he could stare you down. And you knew, like, when he said, you know, our organization knows how to run things. And, you know, you... When he said our organization, I mean, it was just, yeah, you could tell. And when he's looking, when he speaks Arabic to the sheik, you're like, oh, my head, what is going to happen? And then it was a great save by Michael Pena, you know, but that scene was going on. And as you're reading the the subtitles, it's like, well, do you understand what I'm saying? And if it wasn't for that drunk guy who crashed into the table... Like, and again, you're just like, whoa, you know, but that gave Michael Pena's character as the sheik to get up and throw whatever else Arabic he knew <laughs> and said, yeah, the deal's good and whatever. And then De Niro's character is like, OK, never to be seen from again. Yeah. But again, he just set the peril for the rest of the movie. The peril was there. Yes. So let's let's switch gears. We've been talking, obviously, about writing, acting, story and all that fun stuff. Let's switch gears into more of the technical um, so I don't think it's very, it's very much more style. Well, style. Well, it's style and technique. So let's talk about costuming. Um, Do you want me to bring up that there was a bunch of cleavage? Sure, <laughs> you just did. So talk about that. There was a lot of cleavage. Did oh. you know? I mean, as a female, do you notice this a lot? <laughs> I mean, I think I was forced to notice it in this movie. It was pretty in your face. Didn't bother <laughs> me, but I was like, "There's a lot of cleavage." I don't think the guys are. Unhappy there were some great dresses, some great that, clothes. So, yeah, so um. But instead of one statement piece in the movie, there was like fifty statement pieces. And what's wrong with that? I didn't say there was anything wrong. It, with that. it made the movie big. Yeah. There was a lot of style to it. I there liked some the music. Ruffles, too. I liked. <laughs> I, I liked the sequence. There you go. You know what I thought I, from a costuming perspective, which worked into the story, um, is that um. Amy Adams' character dresses um, Christian Bale's character. Yeah. And then eventually Bradley. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, so let's let's go into it. Let's talk about, the, you know, so let's start with the dresses then. 50 what? exactly dresses? And Just there was 50? a lot of outfits in this <laughs> in this movie. You got three actresses, all of cleavage. Um, but I, I thought it added some pizzazz. I thought that the style worked specifically because he did own also the dry cleaners and sure. how they pulled that in and pulled her wardrobe in. And the fact Great that scene, she by does the way. her whole life, yes, and her whole life is being a character. So the fact that she does like embrace that and just go through these routines and it fit for specifically Amy Adams' wardrobe, I thought it was it was great that it was so over the top. She came from being a stripper to being lady edith and hmm. having all these free clothes to me it worked yeah to me that's how she should be dressing was that i mean a lot of the dress yeah, right they, they were sparkling things you know everything i thought the key imagery was all about sparkles and mirrors right so when you right. have the you know as 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 your outfit does you know you can kind of see reflections and things like that and remember they had that one great shot of them dancing and you you pan up and then it's the gold and then you see them dancing from the mirror. Mm-hmm. So it all correlated together in terms of visuals. Mm-hmm. What I loved, what I really liked about the costuming is it could have gone to parody. Like outside of Christian Bale's hair, the, 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 the whatever clothing the characters were wearing seemed to be a not... This is going to sound weird because the movie took place in the 70s, but it seemed very appropriate for the time, and it didn't overdo it. It didn't overstate it. Um, you know, it didn't look Austin Powers-ish. You know, it totally fit whatever time we were watching this movie in, and I appreciated that it, that it didn't look like parody, or you know, and I think it, it could have been a fine line. They, they could have made the decision to make them look, you know, sort of buffoonish in the 70s clothing because some 70s clothing was completely off the charts Mm -hmm. but i think for these characters it made them not only look the part but it made them more real because it it was and i think and you know to that point um real fast any uh buffoonishness that 
came from the characters was on their own behalf, right? So True. Bradley Cooper with, with the, you know, right. and Jennifer Lawrence with the half burnt face from the, and, her, bef- and her hair. And her hair. Her hair. Yeah, you they know. did it to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, when you're doing a movie about the 70s, I was never huge on 70s fashion, but, you know, I do think that you can, it, it could be a fine line to walk when it comes to costuming. It all depends on what kind of a movie that you want to make. Uh, you know, I think the costuming in this particular movie, it worked. Um, I, I thought the design was fine. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think that it was also in kind of the color scheme of how the movie looked that it didn't seem too True. over the top. Yeah. It was because of how they shot it. And nothing was like, although they were statement pieces, mm-hmm. they weren't too bright. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like they were still, there was a tone to them that they all kind of blended. Yeah. And even like Polito's, you know, Not his just, hair was amazing. Hair. Yeah. <laughs> I was, want that hair. It was That's... great. Uh, you know, but his, co- like a politician from New Jersey, I, I, I never doubted the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and. We Based could, on their over the top work. Exactly. And I, I actually really enjoy your point. I think you're right. Everything that looked buffoonish was what they did to themselves. Like when Bradley Cooper is having that, again, it's great. He goes, Ma, he goes, I'm doing it on my own terms. And he's got the curls in his hair. It's like, how can you take that seriously? Side That's note. Great. Side note. I yeah. just have to pull in the scene. Is this the scene where his fiance is in the, in the room? Yeah. yeah. It's just that, like, was, that was a little crazy to me. Yeah. Thank you. Just because I, I was, I I thought she was lying about the fiance for a second because I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Where's his fiance coming from? And this is the most awkward way to deal with a fiance I've ever seen. I know. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would have just been his sister. That would have been, you know what I mean? But I think you didn't really need her. I mean, obviously they referenced her like, hey, uh, you're here with me and you have a fiance back home. Like it was referenced and it was used, but. You didn't need it. You you had the perfect love triangle regardless. I think that I, I think that it further proves that everybody was trying to con everybody. Like to me, when you find, when you find out that he has a fiance, even Amy Adams is like, "Wait, what? Is that a fiance?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 don't, yeah don't worry about it." <laughs> and she's in the room. <laughs> yeah, like, she's like, "What?" She she goes, "I am your fiance." What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, see, that was just confusing to me, especially because. I think with it, we developed to think that Bradley Cooper was enough of a douchebag, or at least a kid who got carried away and right. had these shots of glory. But then you also had him with his fiance that he was just outright denying ish. And I was, I was confused. Like, yeah, I'm sort of engaged. Yeah. I'm like, you're a cop. If you're a cop who gets like carried away down the wrong path and gets a little too greedy, it's one thing. But if at the exact same time, while you're like escalating, you're already kind of at that level with your fiance status. I'm I'm confused. Yeah, I just think he just wanted it all. He felt with the power. He felt that by taking the lead, he goes, "Look at what I'm gonna get from this. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna get the media. This is gonna make my career. I'm gonna answer to no one." He goes, "I have people working for me, Ma," <laughs> and he had nobody working for him. Yeah, you know, it's a again, it's 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 a testament to the acting. He is wonderful at playing the frazzled asshole, isn't he? <laughs> Really good. He's, he really He's is. Really embraced that one. But I'll but but that. I think you know it's it's funny. Again, we, we opened up. Who do you root for in this movie? And if you look at Bradley Cooper's character in Silver Linings Playbook, mm-hmm. at the beginning of the movie, he was that character. I hate. He was an, he was annoying. I he, I hated him. He's a frazzled. He was asshole? a frazzled asshole. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But it, yeah. It, it, in, in in Silver Linings though, again he has his redemption. He changes and you end up liking him a lot and it's part of that relationship but when you look at american hustle too, you know when you're looking at christian bale and they're 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 con people they're conning people it's not it's not a great it's it's not a straight up good job to have they recognize that and by the end it's behind them and i actually love the scene with amy adams and his son at the end mm-hmm. when they were at the school and you know i think that to me David O. Russell's vision for that, I love that. And, um, you know, uh, even Jennifer Lawrence gets who she wants. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of it, well, let's talk about the cinematography because I, I think it ties so well. You know, what I love seeing, there's, there's a lot of great behind the scenes for many movies. 
um, where you have the cinematographers work with the um, with the costumers, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's one thing to just pick out costumes that that look well, but then in working with the lighting team of okay, how is it going to shine? You know, it may mm-hmm. look like this in this light, but how is it going to look under the light of this in conjunction with what we're trying to do on camera and things like that? And uh, again, to that point, I think they nailed it. Yeah, the the cinematography of this movie. Number one, did you realize that it was primarily shot in Boston? I did. That they and they only shot like two scenes in New York because they didn't and, need to. You know what I mean? No, it and, was. And but I thought that that was they didn't. I found out about Boston like later because they did a great job of hiding anything that might have been iconic to Boston. Like I mean, they this hid everything been that could have been iconic, iconic to, to most places. Right. But when they were in New York City, like there was that scene with uh, Christian Bale and Amy Adams as they're crossing the street and it looked like it could have been I don't know like thick, like broad on Broadway or Times Square or something but no I thought the cinematography matched like perfectly it got the look down um, just great and it didn't overdo it. it like you know it didn't over it didn't overstate much like the costuming it it played it so away it that you fantastic. felt it looked fantastic it looked fantastic much like Argo uh, I'll say Going back yeah. to our Argo comparison, because Argo captured the 70s really well, too, and it didn't overstate it. And I felt that the same here. It just, the, uh, the guy's name was Linus Sandgren, and I, I hadn't uh, heard like, about this guy before. He's from Sweden. This is basically what I got up, and he worked on Promised Land. Unlike Argo, though, Argo was a lot of kind of more close-ups and things like that. This, again, even though we didn't see iconic things from New York and, and New Jersey and things like that. Uh, we stayed primarily in wide shots. You know, we got mm-hmm. to, because, again, uh, David O. Russell's things are very ensemble-like. Yeah. And so you want to kind of see, you know, everyone's so brilliant in it. Why wouldn't you show them both in the frame? Right. So I, I, I felt they, they played to that well. Yeah. Yeah, and and it was really complemented very well by the editing, yeah. I thought. Um, Jay Cassidy, I thought he worked with uh, Alec Baumgarten and Crispin Struthers, uh, but I thought that uh, Jay Cassidy and team did a great job. Interesting story about the live and let die. Oh, t- mm. well, I think we'll I go. might know this story, so you go. It was basically shot in one take, but they had to have a backup because um, they didn't know if they can get the licensing mm-hmm. to 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 the song, and they they figured it would cost a bazillion dollars. So they shot the scene and they also shot a backup scene and by stroke of luck colleen camp who played brenda the wire girl she was good friends with barbara broccoli who's part of the broccoli family that that owns james bond they reached out she said oh okay well you know we'll have to go to sir paul mccartney and paul mccartney sir paul mccartney's like Nobody's ever asked to license this song before. Live and Let Die has only been licensed to one movie, and that's the title, <laughs> Live and Let Die. Never before had we seen that, which I didn't know, and fascinating, and Sir Paul McCartney was gracious, so he said, sure, by all means. So, um, But they had their backup, which was Evil Ways. So they, had, they filmed the scene twice in case they couldn't get the song they wanted, but I thought it was great that they did that all in one take. Yeah. And he goes, you've never seen Live and Let Die by somebody cleaning with gloves. <laughs> and I will actually have a different story there on this go. scene to you. Um, that this came to him in a vision about her character before they even really started writing the script. And she got so into it that she threw out her neck while <laughs> filming this. Wow. So she actually awesome. full on threw out her neck. Um, I thought it was fun. I love this scene. I don't want them to take out. But part of me was like, it almost seemed like one of those moments that you put in the middle of the credits. <laughs> like, you know, when you're just like, oh, I'm so glad that they added this because I wanted to see it. But almost like that's where I, it's, it's that type of scene. Does that make sense? It's a credit it's like, scene. The, a credit scene? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> For what reason? I don't know. I just feel that way. <laughs> you have to back up your opinion, Sarah. No? Okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. What did you think of that scene? It's so fun. Um, so fun. What did I think of it? Uh, I don't have. I liked it. I mean, is it a credit scene or not? No, it's not a credit oh. scene. I, thought, I mean, I, I thought it worked in the movie, and especially yeah. to live and let die. Yeah. Like, she was ready. That's it. Yeah. Uh, you know. 
I thought the music. The, but, I don't know if this is where we're going to go. We can talk next, about the music. Were we, did you have anything else about the editing, or like, I, did you like the editing? I like, thought you... I, again. I thought all these right. So we, we went from costuming to cinematography, now to editing, now to music. Again, all these things work in tandem with each other, supporting what's there. Mm-hmm. You know, none of it takes away, or, or you know, not that it doesn't elevate. It's just the perfect marriage of everything. Right. And in terms of the music, what's nice is, you know, it, it fits with the style of the movie, but then at times it's, uh, you know, it's part of the scenes. Right. And, and you know, it means something like, hey, this, you know, for all intents and purposes, this is our song. Right. And I, I love that aspect of it, bringing that in early um, <laughs> with the records. Yeah. Well, you know, that was a... Uh... Again, I, you know, again, one of the reasons I love that 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 whole introduction, you know, you know, hey, is that a Duke Ellington bracelet? She goes, yeah. He goes, oh, I love Duke Ellington. She's like, yeah, saved my life, you know, you know, hundreds of times. He goes, really, which song? She's like, Jeep Blues, I think yeah. is the name of the song. And that could have been a con too, like, yeah. you know what I mean? How many? Because because it could have been like a typical guy, like just noticing something, like, oh, uh, whatever. You like Jay Z? I love Jay Z. <laughs> It could have been like a stifler move. Yeah, I love Twilight, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that you know it, yeah. the, it, it f- you know, their relationship is based on real, right? So it was nice to see that early on versus and okay. and and it also gives credence to. I mean, Amy, Amy Adams, very attractive woman, and you know, would would he takes he goes, do you want to hear it? She's like, now. It's like, yeah, come on, and. You know, you see, he puts the record on, puts the needle down. They're playing Jeep Blues. It's it's Duke Ellington at 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 Newport, and then her over voice kicks in and says, "You know, I, he's not a guy I should be falling in love." She goes, "You know, <laughs> right?" Just just the fat belly. Yep. It is the fat belly. You know, With and, the and what was fingers a, up a, a comb over that was. Um, inspired is that is that is that the quote? I, for, I forget the quote. <laughs> and he's just like sitting there like this. It's a great, and that is hence they have that. Com- which I don't think that Christian Bale's character, uh, Jennifer Lawrence's character, I don't think she would know who Duke Ellington is. No, oh, absolutely not. Right, and and yeah. what I like, you know, obviously it's a party, but I just love the amount of trash behind him versus her. Right, you know, it's because he comes from, you know, he's a. As great as he is, he's a trashy character. Yeah. I mean, they're having a pool party in the middle of winter with all these people, you know, the women in the bikinis outside knocking on the door to come on in. Yeah. I, I mean, I again, I, it was just another one of those magical scenes. So much, in fact, that I went home and I and I bought Duke Ellington at Newport. Uh, $4.99 would, on iTunes. I would buy the soundtrack to this, this movie in a heartbeat. I was I, this close. I was this close. And Todd Rundgren. You. Todd Rundgren's song wasn't in the soundtrack. I like half of the songs in there. It's like, uh, I think if you go into iTunes, I think it's only like 11 or 12 songs. And I'm like, I want the double gated album to this. Like, I want the deluxe. I want every song on there because I felt that the music to this was a tapestry as well. Mm -hmm. It told the story. It told, and it was, and they played everything even like the disco songs didn't annoy i mean it was it was a lot of fun um did you get the sense too amongst the actors that us like their chemistry really worked but i got the sense that they were having a good time working off of one and one another i felt like especially when amy adams and bradley cooper were dancing and even with christian bale and amy Ad- like i felt that they were all they were there. They knew that they were working on something special. You sort of kind of get to me. I, I, I sort of I, got that. I, I think. I mean, you know, David O. Russell has. I think he works obviously really well with actors. He loves working with multiple actors and you know meshing them together. Um. So obviously that's an element, and, and he shoots fast. Again, we talked about this in um. What was the last movie? We uh, it was Dallas Buyers Club. In Dallas Buyers Club, we talked about how how beneficial it can be, you know, to where when you can work at the speed of thought. And David O. Russell shoots pretty fast. I mean, that was, with the fighter, the reason why he got the fighter was, you know, they had a director signed on. He's like, okay, I'm going to need, uh, you know, just 40 days for the fight scenes alone. Like, dude, the movie's not about fight scenes. And so then David o, and David O. Russell understood that. And he's like, okay, I can shoot this in 30 days, including all the fight scenes. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you got the job. Yeah. 42 days, apparently, it took to film this. Yeah. Which is... Uh, 
considering its scope, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Would you? I mean, right? I mean, I would totally. Days. Yes. A month yeah. and two weeks. Yeah. And yeah. how many this. locations they had in this? Two. They basically shot. They they primarily shot in Boston. Well, location, but they primarily yeah. shot in Boston. And I think he said that they did a couple of scenes in New York. So, I mean, yes, they had, you know, wondering how many sets they may have built wherever. Um, you know, the budget on this movie production budget is estimated somewhere around $40 million, which... Uh, actor seems, fees? Yeah. Let's see, that would be the biggest right. you would see. Yeah. And you know? Then, yeah, that's a lot. And, and I would say, I mean, it hasn't come out yet, um, but the, the, the prints and advertising... I mean, the advertising, maybe it's L.A. centric, but out here, I saw the advertising everywhere. It was, it almost rivaled Catching Fire, right? Am I wrong? I mean, I would say I almost, um, yes, definitely, definitely up there. Rivaled it. I mean, Mm -hmm. they they spent a lot, at least out here. And I don't know if it was L.A. New York centric. Um, You know, for me, this was the most anticipated movie of the year, to be honest. For me, I, I mean, maybe, you know, Spider, Superman. But that was a letdown. You know what I want to bring up then? I, I, I do want to bring up. I, I mean, it's no... I'm not hiding the, the fact that I loved it, but I'm curious. And, and I think it's important when you discuss movies. Like, what were the things that you were disappointed at? What was I disappointed at? Um, I was disappointed. I didn't think you need the, the voiceover. I felt it was too much of a crux. crux um, crutch. And he's not, you know what I mean? Knowing what he can do, he's built himself up, David O. Russell, to such a high standard. And the way he tells stories, he went, I think it was slightly a rush job, given that, you know, this, you know, he rewrote the script and things like that. And he just had to get it done. And so he, you know, sometimes as a filmmaker, you reuse techniques that no work. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go, go to that well. Sometimes it's great. But again... Just like in storytelling, what's a cliche? A cliche is something that works. Well, the only right. problem with it is audiences are bored of that and they don't want to see it again. And sure. that, that's, you, you know, uh, in terms of the con, I love, I you know, it wasn't as, you know, the edit, while the editing was great, in terms of pacing of a con movie, especially towards the end, you got to go a little bit faster. Okay. Just a little bit. And that wasn't there. Was, was that it? or I don't, not specific, you know, it's just... There was just something intangible that didn't resonate with me that I wish had. Hmm. Um, and again, it's it's not the fault of... I, I think it just came down to a little bit of the script. Yeah. A little bit of the script, is, you know. And by by a little bit of the script... I, I, again, and, and, I, and I ask because I, I think that... And, and I want your opinion as well because I think this is like... This is what makes talking about movies, you know... This, this is what I love about it, that we can have a different opinion. I think what this show does best and better than anybody else is that we back up what we say, that we we, we, we have experience in this. In part, and we're not just hating to hate, and, and there's something educated behind it because of our fandom. True so that. when you say about, like, the script, so what did you think? Like, was it outside of, like, the overvoice? Was it plot points? Was it I just didn't dialogue? Think, I think if you had just, you know, I was told too many things and had you just let it play out because, you know, we, we've, like, even in Lock, Stock, and Barrel and lo- Lock, Stock, and Barrel, Smoke. and Two Smoke. What is it? I, lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. That's it. <laughs> um, you know, we get a voiceover right at the beginning, but then it just, you're in and it plays out. This, it took about, it felt like 15 minutes just to tell the story. I, I didn't need a huge backstory. They fell in love. They're con artists. Let's go. Okay. But it took too long for me to get there. Partly, I also think that this was the first movie out of, if you want to call it the trilogy, that I was eagerly anticipating. The advertising just, you know, uh, Marissa, who's joined us on other shows, Marissa Serafini, to her point, you know, with the, with the trailers initially, she was like, I understand it's a con movie, but I have no idea what it's about. I personally loved those advertisements because I, going into it, I was like, I'm in. It's a yeah. con movie. I don't know what the heck's going to happen, but great cast. Yeah. Let's do it. And um, and, and the music, whereas, to your point earlier. Exactly. Yeah. And whereas the other ones, you know, were kind of recommendations. I wasn't, you know, I was planning on seeing them, but I wasn't as eagerly awaiting them. And so, I, you know, when the time came, I was like, okay, these are great movies. And you know what? Lived, you know, I'm glad I saw it. And I'm yeah. glad I saw this one. 
but it was built up in the, the biggest way for me. And it, it's not that it disappointed, but it just didn't fully live up to what it could have. And I think I think there is a danger to that. You know, sometimes, some, obviously, think, many things can be overhyped. Like absolutely. Man of Steel. I, I, no, I mean, absolutely. We never did our Man of Steel thing. and I Because that would be a it, complete... But, why is this movie just but terrible? Okay. But but that's okay. Um, but it, we'll, we'll get back to Man of Steel. But I mean, you're you're because you liked it a little bit more. I said it was a good movie, but you didn't it's like it as much as me. It's a good movie. It's right. not a to me. It's not a great movie. It has some great acting and some great moments. To me, it definitely slowed down at parts mm-hmm. where it did really slow. Also, this is it's a thought and it comes from just a feeling that you get towards the movie and how absorbed you get. I can, typically, I can get absorbed by a movie very easily. Like, I, my whole life disappears. Mm-hmm. I'm in the movie, and that's all I'm thinking about. Right. And then, like, randomly someone will start cracking up, and I'll be like, what? There's other yeah. people here? That didn't happen to me as much in this movie. I was very aware of everyone around me, of the audience, of how the audience was reacting. I was very aware of, oh, this is Jennifer Lawrence here. Like, let's intro. And maybe that's because it points, it got slow, so I got distracted. Um, another part is because I, I mentally was thinking, okay, wait, I need to develop my relationship. Or I need to really be in love with this storyline, which is the love story. Sure. Versus going with one of the other characters. I was like, wait, try and see it more from their perspective and mm-hmm. you'll get more engaged. Right. But I I actually had to sit there and go, okay, think about this. It'll bring you more into the movie. Right. Instead of it just uh, absorbing you without me Enveloping trying. You. Sure. And like there are moments that I was like, hilarious beautifully shot beautifully done this is a great spectacle of what's going on sure but throughout the movie i wasn't i wasn't taken away Hmm. i was still like connected to the real world interesting okay and and also i think i think timing again it's if literally this wins best picture it's like argo winning best like they're to me too similar. I think I think it, it's not the movie's fault, obviously, mm-hmm. but you, you're basically a year apart. Yeah, you well, yeah, you are a year apart. They almost yeah. had a Argo came out in uh, October of 2012, I think, yeah. and then this one came out in December, December. 13. Yeah, so I also think other things should win more than it should win best picture yeah and that's it'll, be, it'll be nominated it's gonna be interesting it'll be well, let's talk about that because yeah. it's winning awards without people seeing the movie well the, well this movie and she is another one yes. which you know we'll have to talk about at some point but you're right i mean it's winning awards you know i mean <laughs> you know the the good old screening process and screening it for the hfpa and screening it for various critic organizations making sure that I mean, right now we are in, we're, we're, we're really on the edge of that. The, the all and all out publicity blitz for, for this movie and Dallas Buyers Club and, and Inside Lewin Davis and Wolf of Wall Street is going to hit. And then she is already, I mean, she is already starting to get nominations and wins of stuff. And like, people don't even know what the hell that movie is yet, you know, and you know, unless you're seeing it at like a landmark or sunset, I'm sure is playing the trailer. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I've seen the, I've seen yeah. the trailer quite a bit. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, yeah, we're 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 on that onslaught as to what is going to be. You know, gravity already had, but we're going to see a gravity swell again. And uh, yeah, we're, but we're people, have right. people have seen gravity. People have seen some of these movies. I mean, some of them, yeah. it'll be bigger to talk about when it does actually come out, and then we can really. Well, it comes yeah. out this weekend. It goes wide. I mean, they 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 did the six, three. I'm assuming the by six they meant three in Los Angeles and three in New York. I don't know quite the breakdown, but it did really well. I mean, thus far as of today, it's about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. On just six screens, six locations, that's pretty big. Yeah. You know, I mean, theaters are selling out. And it's not yeah. playing anymore. Like, it was at the Arclight here, but I think they ended their run. I don't think it's continuing till December 20th. Which is uh, a couple of days away. Yeah, yeah. well, that's they, you know, week. they put the pause, get people the anticipation back, and then they'll get the seats filled. Yeah. Yeah. And, but uh, they were already getting them filled. At least the, the, the awards that it has won. 
Let's talk about those. Yeah, I wanted to talk about I wanted to bring up the uh, Golden Globe. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk about that one then. Okay. Because, well, it, it, it's not an award yet. It was a okay. nomination for the Golden Globe. Uh, and it got it under the category of Best Comedy Musical. <laughs> and even David O. Russell has said, you know, Silver it Linings was, Playbook was way got, funny. Was, was, but it got drama. Yeah. I would say that this movie was more of a musical than a comedy. I mean, I, that's what, it, you know, it's funny that you say that because I was like going, I, are they saying it's a musical because of the great soundtrack? Or, or uh, I, I was, it I was say, funny. I would say it's drama, musical, comedy. What else is in that category where they just dry for musicals and comedies? No, but that's where else we no, have, I mean, that's where else we have, um, oh, goodness. What do we, isn't that, isn't Nebraska? In Nebraska's on the comedy and musical comedy too, as well. I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's let's let let's look up Golden Globe nominations, shall we? Basically, we had a bunch of really good dramas, and they decided that we needed to level out some playing field or something. Yeah, I, I think that the HFPA was having a hard time. I think they had a lot of movies that they wanted to nominate. Nominate, and they had to be like. And since they have the People's Choice Awards of of categories to go through, I think that they just stuck things into. Well, it's um, like if you're taking Captain Phillips and you're putting it next definitely to comedy. American oh yeah, it was definitely a definitely com- You know, you take you keep <laughs> Captain Phillips and you put it up against Nebraska, and you say, okay, which one's the drama? Everyone's gonna say Captain Phillips. You say, you put Captain Phillips in American Hustle. Everyone's gonna say Captain Phillips. You put right. American Hustle in Nebraska and you ask people, okay, which one's the comedy and which one's the drama? I think people are going to say, well, they're both dramas. Okay. Does the, that make sense? The, the problem is you can't, you're not supposed to compare. It's, right, there's a big argument. A lot of film critics are saying, you know, this movie's the most, not this particular, but just the phrase, right? The, the, um, it's the most unique movie since blah, blah, blah. Like, right. no. Unique is a state of being. It's either unique or not unique. Oh, I agree. Wait, just like of, a movie. This is no, one of Phil's pet peeves. I, no, no I agree with Just him. like a movie is a comedy or a drama. Yeah. In comparison to Breaking Bad, even though it's a TV show, is this a comedy? Well, yeah. Well, actually, you could argue Breaking Bad is more of a comedy. Would you say it's comedic? But then again, it has comedic elements. There but this, in this, in this is in, from this is born. The, the the gross squishing together of words. So instead of comedy or a drama, you call it a dramedy. Yeah. And it's like, I hate that. So, but I do best, bo- best motion picture, musical, or comedy. The nominations are American Hustle. Give Her, me a drum roll on the last one. Inside Lewin Davis, Nebraska, and... Reza? Drum roll, drum roll. Uh, I'm, hold on, I'm, I'm just looking at the Golden Globe. Why are you like, do your job? <laughs> are we still okay. waiting? It was the, it is the Wolf of Wall Street. Oh. Thank you. Ah, it's a little bit late on that. <laughs> Our right. timing is not so great. We'll work on it. I'm switching <laughs> no, back here. It's all good. There's um, a lot of buttons. So, and again, I haven't seen Wolf of Wall Street. I'm seeing the trailers, and it, uh, I'm seeing the trailers for Wolf of Wall Street, and I'm like going. That looks like a comedy. Um, it could be. It could be a comedy, but you know, I look at Anchorman two as a comedy, and, yes. and I'm not saying you know I, I can look, I look at, at the, the World's way, End way as a comedy. The World's End is a comedy. You know, um, I would even to an extent say the Way Way Back. I could say is more is, is comedy. It's weird because let, let's look at what they have for drama. What they okay. chose is drama. We have Twelve Years a Slave. That definitely that movie. I don't uh-huh. think there's any. The musical. Uh, yeah. How many songs are sung in that? Oh, that's run, true. That, <laughs> run, blank, run. I mean, that's a musical. Run, 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 yep. Oh, my goodness. Oh my <laughs> this God. is such a level. <laughs> Where did we just go? <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Oh, my God. <laughs> Captain Phillips. I mean, uh, you know, Gravity. Okay. Philomena is definitely a drama. Okay. Uh, and Rush, uh, which we talked about here and liked a lot too. I think that's definitely a drama. But it's really weird. I mean, we liked Rush a lot. When Rush got nominated here, I, I gotta, I'll, I'll be honest, as much as I liked Rush, I was a little bit surprised that it got in there. But they're saying because it's the Hollywood foreign press that they have more akin to the story to Rush 
than we would here as Americans. And they're saying they gave it to them because, you know, they're at the Hollywood Foreign Press. They understand the Formula One racing. I don't See, know. It I, was weird. I mean, I do. To me, it does stick out a little bit in the nominations. But I like really loved rush yeah and it's like when i look at what i'm going to buy not that what i sh- want to buy should win i'm like i really want to see rush again i will watch that movie multiple mm-hmm. times yeah, it was a good movie and i don't know i it's like part of me is kind of happy that it made it into that list even though it does stick out as something different compared to the rest i'm glad yeah i i, I agree i mean I, I'm, I'm glad that it got recognition because we here certainly recognize that movie as being a very good movie mm-hmm. and you know it sort of kind of lends credence to what we say <laughs> or yeah. what we're talking about yeah. if somebody i mean we do try um but again i just think that it's really weird that both american hustle I was like, I didn't know that it was a comedy and or a musical. Her, I haven't seen, but the trailers mm. don't look like it's a knee slapper. Uh, Inside Lewin Davis, yes, they can say it's, it's a, a musical, musical, but it's definitely not a comedy. It's Maybe about music. Comic. It's, yeah. I think that American Hustle and Inside Lewis Davis are just in the musical category and they just don't know. Perhaps. Uh. But what about Nebraska? I mean, I don't say that that is I don't know. very much a uh, that Comedy. one I really can't figure out for you. Well, yeah. I think I think they're going to pick up a lot of. I think I think uh, in terms of acting, a lot of nominations headed their way. You know. Yeah, I think and, so. And they've already won. So, I mean, Jennifer Lawrence is being honored for uh, various things already. Uh, let me just double check the facts on on what she's winning. What'd she uh, win? What'd she win? Uh, keep talking. And did I'll she tell get you. the? Uh, did she get the uh, national? Broadcast NBA or NB, uh, national or yeah, NBR. Let, uh, let me let me bring up. Do the I whole. need to be googling this right now? I'm gonna Google it. You guys talk about her. Uh, but Jennifer Lawrence did get nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress for this movie. For this movie, yeah. There you go. Who's she up against? Um, she's up against Sally Hawkins from Blue Jasmine, Lupita Nyong'o. Yep, from, from 12, years. 12 Years Slave, Julia Roberts from August 06. Oh, County talk about the controversy. About Jennifer Lawrence and Julia Roberts? You guys know that one? No. No. What? Go for it. Okay. Thank God I listened to uh, Ryan Seacrest in the morning. Thank God. Hence why <laughs> I... I'm listening to Howard Stern, so, um, <laughs> so I may have missed it. But, but what happened? Okay, so apparently a uh, statement was made by Jennifer, um, you know, of like... Uh, Something, oh, I'm going to butcher this, but uh, something that, you know, Julia Roberts isn't necessarily America's sweetheart or something like that. And uh, Julia Roberts responded something like, oh, how, you know, uh, Jennifer Lawrence definitely, they have some, Julia Roberts now apparently has beef with Jennifer Lawrence. Why? <laughs> over being America's sweetheart. What are you talking about? The title I'm so of, confused. Okay, over Twitter. Uh, this was over Twitter. It was over Twitter. Okay. okay. I, I mean, do I need to be googling this? Yes. yes. Look up the feud between because I don't want to get the facts wrong. But it's it's over the title because of from how you just described that. That makes no sense. I know, but <laughs> in, I mean, where it's left off, Jennifer Lawrence stated that she has no problems with um, Julia Roberts. She has no problem with Jen- uh, with Julia Roberts having the title of America's sweetheart. She doesn't even want to be America's sweetheart. She respects her and things like that. But right. it just got. And especially on Twitter, it's so many people can respond and things right. like that. It just blew out of proportion. Crazy. Um, that but is it's interesting silly, yeah. because, you know, they're in the same category. You know, um, while she's looking that up, let's go back um, to our, you know, to American Hustle. You were ta- I said that I was going to put um, uh, I Heart Huckabees. Yes. You had uh, made a comment earlier on about how David O. Russell works well with actors where, you know, to me... Uh, I Heart Huckabees had so much friction on set. Uh, you know, Lily Tomlin, in fact. I oh, mean, you yeah. can YouTube the stuff where she dresses him down like like crazy on set. It was captured on video. It's been really, you can YouTube it. And, you know, it's really interesting to me is that he was able to, I mean, the movie was a disaster uh, outside of the fact that it had all that controversy while filming and 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 Lily Tomlin's outburst, that that David O. Russell was able to come back, uh, you know, and get to do the fighter, and then you know, and how much he changed as a director. Apparently, he's changed because the, these people like working with him. 
The other thing I thought was sort of kind of neat about American Hustle and about this trilogy is the fact that, do you realize uh, that he wrote Silver Linings Playbook first? Or he adapted it, I should say? Yes. He did that first, couldn't get, <clears throat> you know, couldn't get it off the ground, and he ended up doing, you know, he was offered the fighter. So I think that's a cool, you know, story. And because I think because of the success of the fighter, he was able to do uh, Silver Linings. So that's interesting. Did you find it? I see. Uh, I see that you have Twitter up. Um. So supposedly, um, this article that I'm reading right now doesn't buy it either. There was some comment made by Julia Roberts that went along the lines of, "This is about Jennifer Lawrence. Um, I think she's fabulous, but she doesn't seem dot dot dot. She seems cooler than dot dot dot." So basically, the essence of it was that that that's what's being made of. She seems like too cool to be America's too cool for school. Sweetheart. But I, from the way I'm reading it, I think people are blowing it out of proportion, so and there's out of, no, out of proportion. there's no context of like anger or jealousy over the title America's Sweetheart. <laughs> I think it was just casual conversation <laughs> yeah. that people then are like, wait. Let's just look take at out these two Twitter's words dangerous. That's the check bottom out, line. Check out this video. Go back to the moment when I announced there's beef between Julia Roberts and Jennifer Lawrence and look at your guys' reaction like, tell me more. You know? It's, yeah. it's like, yeah, you guys were in shock. B, tell me more. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's what it is. seem like such nice people. And yeah. I'm like, they really can't be. They're too nice. I Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in their own right. Yeah, who cares? And I think that they like, both are kind of America's sweethearts over time. So there you go. Listen, they both had their day in the sun, uh, you know, and right now it's Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence is the flavor of the month. Uh, the only thing, you know, right now is, is it, do you say that it's too much Jennifer Lawrence? I mean, because a, a, an audience can turn on you. And I think Jennifer Lawrence is smart enough. And I think the people that she's, that she associates herself with are also smart enough that, Whatever well, her next role I, is, or maybe well, she'll take time off, but I, I know like she's, she's doing the next smart. catching fire. I think fire. she was very smart about her career. I would say the same as Julie Roberts. She's always been pretty smart. She's been around for a really long time. She did a ton of movies in one period. I would say the same with, like, Kate Winslet earned her fame pretty early and was, like, the starlet and also controlled her career very well. Yeah. I would say Jennifer Lawrence is on a very good foot, mm. and although she is very prevalent and, like, the intention's all on her, I don't think... I, mean, I don't think it's just a, a blip. Okay, so Christian Bale, he's also in From the Furnace. Mm -hmm. which, you know, um, out of the Furnace? Out of the Furnace. Into the Furnace. Um, out of so how do you furnace. compare him to, you know, um, I haven't seen that yet, so I can't compare, like, you know, it, it becomes tough when an actor has the same movies coming out so close. How do you Absolutely. compare him versus this? Well, look at With Jennifer Tom Lund Hanks. Yeah. It has Saving Mr. Banks and Captain Phillips. Yeah, and Jennifer Lawrence, you were gonna say what? Catching Fire? Or? No, I was gonna. Well, Catching Fire, obviously, but in terms of awards, okay, she just won an, an Oscar last year. Right. Mm -hmm. Is this performance? First off, as a supporting actress, she's not. She, yes, she does a great job. Is she on screen enough to be a supporting actress? You know, I mean, obviously supporting them. You know what I mean? But there's I, people who are on screen more that I think should and deserve it. I think that this, I don't know if I'm answering your question, um, because I think there's three ways you have to look at it. One, to be nominated for a movie, I think you have to deserve it from that movie, like have enough screen time or make a big enough impact in the plot or be a big enough device or whatever to be nominated. And then I think you compare who's in the categories to win by year. I don't like it when people compare a supporting actress from this year to a supporting actress three years ago mm -hmm. because it's it's a different year it's a different set of awards we're not it, you can't do that the same thing if she won last year i don't think you should really compare her acting that role compared to what it is now i don't think that's fair i think you have to separate it by years i think you have to go down to the movie from the movie to who else is in the category. But it's the same as if, if, if let's say, I won an award and everyone said, like, oh, you only won it because of your body of work, not really for that movie. And, and were, that oh. happens all the time. And I'd be like, it. good. That good. means my body of work is so good that Sorry. I just had that's to not, get that's an award. That's not what that award is. That's what lifetime but, achievements are for. No, but, but, like, but, 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 but yeah, I, to Phil's point, unfortunately. Well, first thing, let, let's talk Jennifer Lawrence. I think she would 
fall under best supporting she, you know she you know she falls under the the Judy Dench clause so to speak you know personally I thought that her presence in the movie while she may not have had the same screen time as say Amy Adams her presence was felt was ever felt throughout a lot of that movie um, in various scenes that we talked about here, whether it's singing Live and Let Die or whether it's the scene with the microwave or the scene at the casino with the mobsters, I think her presence was, you know, was mm-hmm. was was great and felt throughout. I agree with your point 100 percent in in that. Yeah, I do believe that, you know, it should be nominated for that year. But then, you know, to Phil's point, the Academy Award has a history of doing things like that. Like, for example, Russell Crowe's a great example. He won for Gladiator. I'm not taking anything away from Gladiator. It was fantastic. But the year before, I believe he was up for, uh, for like, Inside Man. And they didn't give it to this. So it's almost like sometimes people say, well, he, he got this award because of his performance there. <laughs> And they do it for movies all the time, like I Lord know, of the Rings. And it's annoying, but it, it, it is. It's a sick, it creates a cycle. It's like, oh, but we had to give it to this person when we should have given it to that person. So now in three years, when he's up for something else, we're going to give it to them, it's, even though this person, like, it's it's a body, it's a body politic. Year. It's it's a body politic that votes. Then have a ten so year it's, special it's, it's of the shame. Academy Awards where you have the all stars. Well, I can I go into know. what I feel that the Academy <laughs> should do, you know, to, to 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 garner fresh blood. But here's the thing: I mean, when we look at uh, the Return of the King, mm-hmm. okay, that won Best Picture. That won right. eleven. It won, a, it won a, yeah, and it won a right. And and here's the deal: it didn't win it for Return of the King. It won it for the entire trilogy because each of those movies were nominated for Best Picture. In every year that those movies, like the, 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 you know, Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King, he didn't get it for anything. And it was almost like, well, he made this great body of work. We're going to give it to him for Return of the King. And unfortunately, you know, and I do, I mean, I agree with you. It should go the year, but I think the voting mentality uh, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, people are saying, and we felt he maybe yeah. should have won it for this one. So this was a very good performance, but we'll give it to him for this one. I mean, Sc- Scorsese. How long did it take for Scorsese to win an Academy Award? True that. Uh, right. So uh, you know, and it's like I'm. I don't know. I just think that come up with another solution instead of not giving it to the deserving people of that year. Do something so you can honor people for their bodies of work so you can acknowledge them. Because people are aware of the yeah. fact that it was so good. And I'm not saying that they don't deserve recognition. I'm just saying it's an award show that happens every year. Base it on the year's work. Fair right. enough. Let's, let's, talk, let's, let's bring home with uh, American Hustle. In, in, you know, we, uh, I know you guys talked about, um, I think it was a movie that I wasn't here for. I think it was Nebraska where you guys talked about, you know, how no matter what, you guys can watch it in any period of time Mm -hmm. is this a movie that will be revisited i believe so for me yes i mean i will uh, what i'm hoping for uh, although this is a a, a, i forget who released his previous movies uh like the fighter and silver linings but it would be great if you know since he is calling it a trilogy if there was a way to box up these three movies i I think think if it's a box that i'll buy it but uh, however the only thing is if another studio i'm not sure sony released the fighter and Mm -hmm. i'm not sure i forget who released uh silver if they're different studios i don't think that'll happen just because of. i think it was weinstein who did uh, yeah the fighter i think um Perhaps. Yeah. So I think Weinstein might have done both. Yeah. So, but in any case, you know, for me, yes. I mean, I'll be able to watch this movie. I think, I think it will be remembered for its performances um, and and such. And I think thematically, and again, because you're setting it into the 70s, you're already setting it into it already in a sense because they did it respectfully. it, it, It makes it, you can watch it at any time and not have it feel like it's dated because it already is in a sense dated. It's like watching. I'm not comparing it to The Godfather, but you can go back and watch The Godfather, even though it takes place at a certain time period. You yep. can continue to watch it because it has a good story, and it's already, in a sense, it's dated. So, and I think American Hustle does the same thing. It, it I works. mean, the logos, right? The the logos were done in a way that was from the old one, right? I, um, what are you talking like when? When no, I uh, think that was in. A- 
Frosca. No. Was that Dial's Pony? No, right? The logo's... The- I'm, I know I know what you're saying, and I don't think that's for this film. I think that was for another film we did. We watched well, way too many movies. I, no, 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 no. I think you're talking about the way Anna Purina... Anna... Yes. Anna Purina came on. Yes. It was very that, that shadowy, very 70s-ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, oh, yeah. don't yeah, yeah. say no, I'm wrong, okay. sir. I'm talking about right. one of the movies we covered recently. The actual... I think it was the Paramount logo or something on one of them was the actual version from... I think it might have been Dallas Buyers Club where it was the actual yeah. logo that was in circulation during that yeah. period. And well, and, but Anna like, Pur- Argo did the same thing, but I'm Anna Perna, uh, that logo had that, that shadow effect yeah. that came out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't say I'm wrong. <laughs> I was just clarifying. I was correct. I yep. was clarifying. And in Argo, it's funny because Argo used the old Warner Brothers logo. See, yeah. that's, that's more you know, for, for, for For that, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I like that. I think, I think it's fun. It's I like when they do that too. It's like trivia. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <It's like> tri- <laughs> How Are did the Warner Brothers logo look like that? Yes, Are we we're, done? I think we're asshole? done. I think. Yeah. I think we're getting so off topic and so out of hand. No, but I. But I do think it's legacy. Look, it, it's, it's. We know. Do we agree that it's going to get nominations? Like oh, a lot. Absolutely. Right. Yes. I think. Yeah. I mean, it's going to. Yeah, and I think it'll be under Best Picture, not Best Comedy. And or musical. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I'm excited to see musical. audience reaction. You know, we're talking about this now, but we've seen it. But it's not uh, the, uh, the audience. Hey. I think is gonna love it. Yeah, I think the audience is gonna love it. Hey, we did talk. But about- it's a very specific type of audience. It's but not I really be- just think everyone's. Gonna- I think so. I think yeah. it'll be the uh, like an it movie. Well, you know, when yeah. talking about the music, anybody note that Danny Elfman did the score? I didn't even notice there was score, but yeah. Danny Elfman worked on this Danny movie. Danny Elfman. Uh, easy job for him. What do you need me to write? Oh, yeah, what do you what do you need me to do? Seconds of music, great, done. Good. I'll yeah, do it tomorrow. Simple. It's it's crazy because you had Danny Elfman did score, but the Susan Jacobs have to give her a lot of credit because she helped put together the soundtrack and getting the licenses. Oh, so. she did great. She's fantastic. So, come on, iTunes, give us a double album. I'll All right, it. guys. Thank you guys for joining us yet again for another Anatomy of a Movie. Uh, Dimitri, where can they find you? They can find me here at Anatomy of a Movie. Go on to YouTube. Go on to iTunes. Go on to anatomyofamovie.com. Leave your comments. You know, I just noticed, hey, guys, we've hit sort of kind of a milestone. 1,700 views for Catching Fire. That's because we're Catching Fire. That's fantastic. And why are there only, I'm- like, one comment? People, if you're watching us, comment. Tell us. They're, Let us know what you too think. Scared. Or <laughs> at this point in time, the new YouTube comment system is just confusing everybody. Unfortunately, it really is. Sarah Stratton. Hi. <laughs> Find her in a movie is coming soon because she is a great actress. Uh, and of course, follow us at Movie Anatomy on Twitter, uh, AnatomyMovie.com, Facebook.com/AnatomyMovie. Uh, we'll see you here for uh, The Hobbit. We've got Ooh. Lone Survivor coming up. We've got Saving Mr. Banks, Wolf of Wall Street, and a slew fun. of others coming up in 2014. we got to be doing our top tens, right? And we have to be talking about nominations. There's okay, so much exciting things. we got so much things. things. All right. All right, got to reel it in. Sorry. And that'll be All next right. episode. See you guys then. Bye. <laughs> From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. Thanks for watching Anatomy of a Movie on YouTube. For more on your favorite movies, subscribe to our channel here, and be sure to let us know what you think in our comment section below here. Bye.